Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the political and security implications of Taliban rule in Afghanistan, which is being hosted by the Carnegie South Asia program. My name is Akil Shah. Um, I'm a professor of South Asian politics at the University of Oklahoma and a visiting scholar in the Carnegie South Asia program for this academic year. Let me take this opportunity to encourage everyone who's watching to visit the Carnegie website, carnegieendowment.org, to sign up for South Asia, forthcoming South Asia events, if, in, if you haven't already. So it is truly my distinct pleasure and privilege to host this very timely and important discussion with Ahmed Rashid. Ahmed doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, Ahmed Rashid is a veteran, a seasoned Pakistani journalist who has worked on uh, Afghanistan and Central Asia for 40 years. Uh, I mean, he worked on the Taliban um, in the 1990s, um, before 9-11, before it became a cottage industry. Uh, he's the author of, amongst other books, the classic Taliban, Militant Islam, Fundamentalism and Oil in Central Asia. And if you haven't read the book uh, and you want to understand the Afghan Taliban and regional dynamics, uh, it is never too late to get a copy. Ahmed, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. Great to be here. Um, so I'll start with a series of questions and towards the end, maybe 15, 20 minutes, we'll open it to questions from the audience. So there's a lot to cover, but let me start with the elephant in the room. Um, was the status quo, the so-called status quo in Afghanistan sustainable? The Biden administration believes it wasn't, but we have seen some rumblings from American military commanders um, claiming uh, otherwise. What, what, what do you think? Well, I, quite frankly, I mean, I think, you know, if the Americans had, had uh, uh, re retained a minimum of air power and uh, two and a half, three thousand troops, it would have been a deterrent, I think. But uh, uh, the fact is that, you know, th there were mistakes on all sides. Um, uh, the Americans pulled out even before they had pulled out their civilian um, uh, diplomats and uh, experts. Um, and, and the um, Americans pulled out their military uh, before anything else. And that was um, catastrophic, I think, uh, which led to the panic of the, of the final um, uh, American withdrawal and the trying to get the civilians out at the last minute. And um, so I think, you know, I mean, there have been faults all around. And, and obviously, the, the Rani government has to face a lot of uh, the, the blame because of the way that Ashraf Ghani fled the country, and his ministers, nobody stood their ground. Um, but I think, you know, uh, we, we, we were seeing that the Doha agreement that was carried out um, a year earlier had in fact started the whole process of demoralization of the Afghan forces, the Afghan political mm -hmm. class. Um, I think the Afghans knew perfectly well that they were not able to sustain um, a, a government and an army uh, to face up to the Taliban if the Americans were not going to be there. Okay. Um, uh, so moving on to the Taliban, uh, given your there's some uh, given your deep knowledge of the Taliban leadership um, and what we have seen since they've captured Kabul in terms of the repression of women's protests, uh, the displacement of the Hazaras, and the squabbling that we saw over the interim cabinet. Um, do you think they can govern Afghanistan? I mean, is there a plan? Well, I, I'm, I must say, you know, I was quite amazed to see the Taliban come back in, in almost exactly the same way as they came back, uh, as they took, uh, uh, took the offensive and uh, uh, co conquered Afghanistan in 1993, 94. Um, and, you know, I mean, the first thing that hit you was that they, they had to depend on their young thugs to maintain law and order in the streets of Kabul with whips and sticks. They, they had not even, nobody had even been through a, a process of crowd control. Um, and we saw how they handled the crowds at the airport. Mm -hmm. And then I think everything has deteriorated um, after that. Uh, we saw women being beaten. We saw uh, journalists being beaten. Um, and none of the, uh, it seems that none of the um, lessons of the 90s were learned, was learned at all by the Taliban. And it was uh, very depressing to uh, to see this and, and a very big shock because everyone thought the Taliban have been in, uh, you know, the leadership has been 
um, uh, in reclusive, but they're probably training their young kids. They don't have a, a cadre which is able to, I think, govern properly, um, or which is modern in any any sense of the word. And um, uh, I think that's going to be their big problem. I foresee a continuous stream of restlessness among population demonstrations, riots, um, maybe not an armed opposition to the Taliban because that would take some time to organize and has many other problems. But certainly, I think public dissatisfaction, um, uh, the way the women have come out, you know, and mm -hmm. today, I mean, they've announced again that the women will not be allowed to go to Kabul University. And you have a, a, a young zealot who's become the chancellor of, of, of the university. So it's... Uh, um, it's it's a very very bad situation at the moment, and the Taliban don't seem to be doing very much to rectify it. So, do you think this is kind of a throwback to the 1990s? Um, and obviously, the well, I think is, I think the, the crucial question that everybody's been asking me is that you know have the Taliban changed? And I, quite frankly, I've been saying for a long time, no, they haven't. But not not because of these actions that they have taken against mm -hmm. the, the public, but. They, are, they, are, they have a very um, a oppressive ideology, um, and that has not changed at all. And it's like, you know, asking uh, 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 in, anyone with a firm ideological bias um, to, to drop their ideology and, and become liberals or, or something like that. And what, what, we, what we've seen, I think there are three major factors that have sustained the Taliban in this time. The first is this whole ideology that they have interpreted of Deobandi Sunni Islam, which is um, uh, extremely severe and, and strict and basically depends on punishment for, for being uh, a good Muslims and being Islamic. In other words, we will punish everyone very severely if they cross the, the boundary line of uh, who we are and what we believe in. Uh, the second thing is that uh, uh, the is is Pashtunwali. and the Taliban interpretation of Pashtun Valley, which I discussed in my earlier book, is completely wrong. Uh, Pashtun Valley is not something aggressive, and um, it is something that you know you you treat the way you treat your guests, uh, the way you behave in public, um, and so that has not changed. I mean, their interpretation of Pashtun Valley, like their interpretation of Deobandi Islam is um, ob obje totally objectionable. The, the headquarters of Deobandism is actually in India. And if you, if you read about them, they're the most peaceful Muslim group in India. Um, they're very conservative, but they're very peaceful at the same time. So none of that has really changed. Mm -hmm. And one expected that these Taliban have been in exile abroad, their mm -hmm. children have been to university and college. They would have bought in by now some younger elements of their, um, the, the children of the leaders, for example, uh, to try and help them understand the modern world and govern. Mm -hmm. They haven't done anything like that. Um, there, are no, there are hardly any young people involved with the, you know, with the Taliban. And the older generation is still, uh, some of them have still very close links to Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. and the whole belief yeah. in, in, in global jihad, even though that is not the Taliban's philosophy. Mm -hmm. The Taliban yeah. overall philosophy is is a is a much more nationalistic jihad be, belief in turning Afghanistan into a pure Deobandi state, mm -hmm. not necessarily trying to um, uh, create a a global jihad like uh, Osama bin Laden did. Okay, there is a view of, uh, by some in the Western media on the left, but also in countries like Pakistan that outside of Kabul and Herat and other major urban centers, people have, you know, uh, seen the Taliban uh, return to power as a, as a, they have kind of heaved a sigh of relief because they were, you know, fed up with war and the atrocities of Afghan security forces and the human rights violation of American forces. What do you think of that uh, reading of the, the, the rest of Afghanistan, as they call it? Is that, is that accurate or? What the re re reaction has been in the countryside to the, the mm -hmm. Taliban, but I'll, I'll I'll say a couple of things. I think 
first of all, the majority of Afghans do not like the Taliban. Mm -hmm. They didn't in, in 93, and I, I don't think they like it now. But what they do like is an end to the fighting and the war. And uh, But of course, that has brought new hardship for the Afghan population in the, in the, in the wake of uh, not being enough food and a humanitarian crisis, economic crisis, no cash available, the banks are shut down. Um, so what I, so again, in, in, envisage very much is, yes, there will be a welcome sigh of relief by many rural Afghans in, in the countryside who will now be able to at least uh, walk or walk around without fear of getting shot. But um, the uh, uh, in time, I think the Taliban's failure, and this is what happened last time. Mm -hmm. in, in, um, in, in 99, there was a huge famine in Afghanistan uh, when the Taliban were ruling, and that completely de demoralized mm -hmm. the population and that actually stepped up the resistance to the Taliban when a lot of the former warlords came back and started fighting. And I envisage something like that happening again, because the Taliban are not going to be able to um, uh, uh, produce policies which will feed the people. That was the case in 93. It's going to be the case very quickly, possibly within weeks and months now, that the Taliban will be um, you know, told to provide food. And uh, that food will not be available because of uh, wh whatever, sanctions, um, uh, uh, a reluctance to allow NGOs, for example. I mean, one of the terms of the of, of humanitarian aid is that the NGOs and the UN should be allowed to distribute that rather than the Taliban, because the fear is that it, food distributed by the Taliban will just go into their military uh, wing rather than anything else. So they 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 have to be um, uh, that there has to be an acceptance of uh, the role of NGOs in the United Nations, which again the Taliban are probably not going to accept. Okay, thank you. Um, so just moving ahead to the issue of counterterrorism, and the Taliban have uh, repeatedly assured the international community. Can you hear me, Ahmed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that no, you know, we will not we will not allow Afghan soil to be used for terrorism against other countries. But what does that mean in practice? I mean, how how do you think they'll deal with Al Qaeda and the assortment of foreign and local militants that are present in Afghanistan? Well, I think you know this is a really important question, and again, my answer is first of all, how does the West suggest that they deal with them? Do you want the Taliban to shoot Al Qaeda, execute them? Do you want to put them in jail? Do you want to put them in a safe house? What is the answer for these 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 uh, bad guys? Because the problem is that the Taliban have a sense of loyalty to them. They have fought for the Taliban. They were deeply involved in this recent offensive, which took place, you know, out, uh, allowing them to enter Kabul. Um, they have fought and died for the Taliban. The Taliban are not going to be in a position to suddenly turn against these militant groups and say, I'm going to get rid of you now because, you know, the Americans want me to get rid of you and the world community does. So un unfortunately, what we are going to see is, um, is probably uh, these people will be told to lie low for the time being, not to do anything yeah. provocative. But we saw in the case of bin Laden, I mean, he had also been told to lie low and not to do anything provocative after the bombing of the embassies in uh, Tanzania and Kenya. Um, and yet, you know, he did 9-11. And, 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 you know, uh, and many of the Taliban were very angry at him for doing that. So the, the, there's a real conundrum here. How do you deal with these groups? Um, how do you get the Taliban to deal with these groups? What would you suggest as to how you deal with these groups? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem, which is not going to be um, uh, just dealt with by... Uh, the Americans saying, you know, the the, uh, the the Taliban's responsibility is to do this. But the Taliban have to have to have a, a way out. I mean, how are they going to deal with these people um, without antagonizing them and leading to a new kind of civil war? Mm -hmm. But that brings me to uh, Afghanistan's uh, neighbor from hell, uh, Pakistan. Um, we know that the military wanted, Pakistan's military leadership wanted strategic depth against India. 
it has gotten that. But at the same time, the, the Taliban have not been very helpful with uh, helping Pakistan contain the Tehrik e Taliban Pakistan, which is a major sec internal security threat to Pakistan. Um, so the question is, what is now the nature and limits of uh, uh, Pakistani influence or leverage over the Taliban? Well, you know, I, I think it's being reduced all the time. I mean, simply uh, the first element about TTP is, yes, um, I think sensible people in Pakistan were warning um, the government and the military that um, the Taliban are not likely to suddenly become very obliging to Pakistan. They want to distance themselves from Pakistan. They want to show that they're independent of Pakistan and that what they've achieved, they've achieved on their own without any help from Pakistan. So the last thing they're going to do is to start um, uh, killing TTP or rounding them up. So I, I think that's that's a, the first point and, and very important, which is we're not going to see um, uh, the Taliban government in Kabul obliging the Pakistanis excessively, um, uh, whichever way we look. Um, and uh, uh, Pakistan has not raised m many issues regarding the social. I mean, it wants a, a, a better cabinet than the mm -hmm. Taliban have put together, uh, but it has not raised issues like women and other social issues, um, which would perhaps uh, annoy the Taliban. The Taliban are doing their best to keep a fairly straightforward relationship. They they raised the Kashmir issue with the Indians, something that was probably uh, uh, liked a lot in Islamabad. Um, they've uh, uh, you know they they've asked the Taliban to form a, a more inclusive government. I think what we've seen in the last couple of weeks has been a, a shift in Pakistan's policy from just blindly supporting uh, the Taliban to being much more in sync with the international community. So, for example, it's very clear now that the Pakistanis will not be recognizing mm -hmm. the Taliban yeah. government in a hurry. And they would like a, a group of uh, like-minded countries and allies of Pakistan, China, Russia, Qatar, um, Iran, uh, to maybe do this recognition business together. And, and, and none of these countries are want to do it in opposition to the international community. So I think what we are going to see is a Pakistan hesitating and, and not being um, and not recognizing the Taliban government quickly, nor will these other countries, unless we see progress on the Taliban front and the international community actually allowing humanitarian aid and other kind of money, aid and money uh, to to at least the NGO and the civil society community um, in Afghanistan. So I think Pakistan's policy has suddenly suddenly changed a bit. And uh, I think the, um, I've got a message here saying, turn your volume down on your computer. Oh, right, well, let, let me, so anyway. Yeah. One second. Yeah. Is that better? Yes, I think so. Is that better? So I think I think Pakistan's policy is a bit more in sync now with the mm -hmm. international community, um, but at the same time, it it can't take the risk of annoying the Taliban by trying mm -hmm. to take the position that, for example, the Americans and the Europeans have, mm -hmm. which is, um, as far as the Taliban are concerned, a very extreme position uh, of of uh, opposition, um, and we we are now faced with a huge um, economic crisis in Afghanistan. And it has to be seen that, you know, how the West uh, tackles that. And uh, uh, perhaps it would be a good idea for the West to encourage four or five countries to recognize the Taliban um, government so that aid can flow. Uh, and perhaps that could be followed up by other, other countries later on. But I don't, unfortunately, see um, uh, concessions on the social issues like women and education mm -hmm. and, 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 and that. And... And, and that is really, uh, I mean, the Taliban are just dropping a big stone on their foot every time they announce something derogatory uh, about the role of women. So Pakistan is uh, you know, selling this idea of uh, an inclusive government. And the, the, the Taliban have also pledged that they'll create an inclusive government. Do you think it, it, it's even possible for an inclusive Taliban government, given that, you know, it's a concept alien to their default governance model, which is, you know, a centralized, uh, 
dictatorship run by an Amir al-Mu'minin. So what would a inclusive government mean short of a, you know, a consultative process or an election for that matter? Well, in their latest additions to the cabinet, they've tried to, their interpretation of inclusive is that mm -hmm. we, we do not just form a Pashtun government, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but we form um, a multi-ethnic government. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a few, there's there two Tajiks, there's an Uzbek, there's a Hazara, mm -hmm. uh, now in the government. I mean, you know, the cabinet is now about 55 people and, you know, they've appointed about five people belonging to the ethnic minorities. Um, which is hardly enough to satisfy anyone. And anyway, these ethnic minority representatives are also very close to the Taliban. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. what the interpretation of inclusive means for the West is that there should be um, uh, people from the past government, perhaps technocrats, mm -hmm. um, the people who know something about governance, etc. And uh, so far, as, as you know very well, we've not seen any uh, attempt to improve governance to establish the, the, the new rules of behavior, what is the government going to do economically, how is it going to get cash, um, uh, how is it going to treat the neighbors, etc. Um, we haven't seen any attempt yet um, of, of the Taliban moving into this policy making framework um, mm -hmm. and, and trying to enlist the help of perhaps technical people who would know something about it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that don't forget that there is, I think, uh, uh, tensions within the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And oh. um, certainly the Taliban expected their leaders to announce precisely this kind of government that we have seen now already, meaning a hard line, 100% Taliban government, mm -hmm. um, no concessions to the former politicians, no concessions to the warlords or anyone else. Um, and uh, uh, but you know so but this is not really going to work very well, frankly. It's not going to be effective, and it's going to probably increase the squabbling between mm -hmm. moderates who could be mullah brother, and and uh, the more extreme groups like like the Haqqanis, um, who who want control over um, everything. Basically, there are four Haqqanis in the cabinet, and they they certainly will have they have the run of the mill. At the moment, so I'm I'm uh, I, I'm I'm not particularly hopeful that the Taliban are going to wake up one morning and decide that you know we've got to uh, uh, play the tune that the West is setting and that for our own good we need an inclusive government. We need to impress the people of Afghanistan that we be, we love everyone. We we are not anti this group or that group. Is there any leverage yeah. Pakistan has over the Taliban? Um, given that, you know, the Taliban are now in power and maybe they don't need a physical sanctuary in, 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 in Pakistan. So what what are the so, sort of mechanisms or levers of uh, Pakistani influence left uh, for them to shape the Taliban's behavior? I mean, I mean Pakistan has sent in uh, the, one of the first countries to send in uh, truckloads of humanitarian aid. Um, they uh, have flown the first uh, uh, pr private airplane, the Pakistan International Airlines. I mean, um, these small steps, uh, and they have um, they, they have sent senior officials uh, to Pax, to to uh, Afghanistan. Um, but you know, I think the influence is going to get less and less because, as I said earlier, the Taliban. It's in the Taliban interest to be more Afghan than the Afghans right now. Um, and the Taliban don't want to do anything. Uh, and, and there is a lot of uh, opposition inside the country to the role that Pakistan has played in the past in backing the Taliban, going back to 1993 and then again, uh, the revival of the Taliban after 9-11, uh, which it seems the Americans were um, asleep when that was happening or they were busy in Iraq when, when, when that was happening. Um, so uh, influence, I think, is going to diminish more and more. If the Taliban are going to persist in this form of government, governance and this, this particular type of cabinet, um, and they're going to snub the West and defy the West and say, well, we are doing this, whether you like it or not. 
And if the people are starving, well, you know, I mean, so what? That's you, if you want to help them, you help them by giving us food, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I, I fear very much that the Taliban are going to be very hardline and that Pakistan's influence is not going to be of an extraordinary amount. Certainly, it is the country with the most influence at the moment. Um, but that influence is diminishing, I think, uh, uh, pretty fast. Haqqani network is in, uh, or leaders of the Haqqani network are in important positions in the cabinet. And as you know, the Haqqanis have a, you know, um, interest in Pakistan, real estate interests, their families and children live there. Um, is that leverage um, that can't be used or the Taliban don't really care or what do you think? Taliban leadership uh, have their families uh, in in Pakistan, uh, their children are going to school and college yeah. there. Yeah. They have business interests, as you say. Um, I mean, we haven't. I mean, some of the leaders certainly have come back into Afghanistan, but we haven't heard anything about the families. Mm -hmm. uh, when will they? When will these Taliban families, the leadership families, actually come back into Afghanistan and 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 start living there? Um, at the moment, that hasn't happened, and. Uh, it surely has to happen if the Taliban are going to retain any kind of credibility with the with the Afghan population, and if they are going to try and persuade uh, people that they are distancing themselves uh, from Pakistan and um, and Iran too. I mean, there are large numbers of Taliban mm -hmm. leaders in, in Iran, um, and uh, so I, you know, I think this the the role of foreign influence of the neighbors. Uh, except for the, the wealthy neighbors, in other words, China and Russia, yeah. is going yeah. to diminish. Remember, the Taliban's friends are all bankrupt at the moment. I mean, Pakistan, Iran, um, uh, these are the two closest countries. They can't help the Taliban in any way because they have uh, their own economies are completely um, depressed and under pressure. Um, China and Russia are not going to take any step on their own. They're not going to... Uh, jump in uh, because the Chinese, they've both learned from past experiences uh, that you have to be very careful with the Afghans um, and you can't uh, um, steamroller them into uh, accepting something, even though the Taliban have frequently mentioned the role of China and the yeah. money and uh, the, the rebuilding that China has promised it will do. But China is not going to do this uh, uh, if if this kind of situation remains in Afghanistan, and uh, the entire world it, it remains uh, um, uh, un unwilling to help the Taliban, um, that you brought China. Um, what is China's kind of calculus in Afghanistan in terms of? You know, they're concerned, uh, their uh, militants, the Uyghur militants who they're really concerned about and the violence and militancy that can emanate from Afghanistan. Is that one of the sticking points or you think or? Well, I, I mean, the Chinese uh, seem to have worked that out because at this very important meeting in Beijing between the Chinese foreign minister and Mullah Brother, uh, Mullah Brother, uh, announced publicly that um, the Uyghurs would uh, not be supported by the Taliban, especially those Uyghurs living in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And um, there are several hundred Uyghurs living in Afghanistan who've been fighting for the Taliban. Mm -hmm. Again, we go back to this problem of what, you know, if the Taliban are seen to be imprisoning or killing or um, uh, jailing uh, the, the Uyghur militants who are in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. it's going to go down very badly with many of the Taliban. Um, the, the Afghan Taliban and go down very badly with the Islamic uh, community in general. So they're, they're really trapped here. They want Chinese help. They want Chinese money. They want China to take a major role in uh, exploiting the mineral resources of Afghanistan. Um, but they'll have to stick to this. And the Chinese will be watching them very closely. Uh, that, you know, will they adhere to this promise? not to help the, the Uyghurs. I think they will, but they will create more problems for themselves because the Uyghur mm -hmm. population in Afghanistan is likely um, to resist. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, so we, we are faced again, I mean, the Taliban are faced again, once again, with this conundrum uh, as to what to do with the militant groups. 
China's role has become less and less. Uh, China, uh, three years ago, China was playing a major role even in trying to broker a peace settlement. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Chinese met uh, with the Afghan, with the Taliban, uh, who had been bought to meet them by Pakistan. Pakistan was very keen that China promised the, uh, the, the, um, the Chinese that, the, that they would help in the peace process. And China got deeply involved. And then um, I think China realized that nothing was happening. And it was all talk, and there was really no compromise between these two parties. Uh, the government in Kabul or the um, uh, uh, the Taliban, and as long as uh, there was no compromise, you know that China's role would become more and more difficult. And the Chinese pulled out basically from any peacekeeping role, peacemaking role that they had allotted to themselves. Um, they pulled out and and stood on the sidelines and watched Doha and watched everything else that was happening uh, between the Americans and the Taliban without playing much of a role themselves. Um, so right now, I think the Chinese are obviously pleased that the Americans have left Afghanistan, that um, uh, the Americans have come, have shown to be extremely incompetent as far as this withdrawal has, has, has been concerned. Um, but, uh, 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 but the Chinese at the same time are not going to get involved prematurely uh, when there's still no uh, a real peace settlement or anything else. What about Russia? You mentioned Russia, but also um, uh, the Central Asian countries, primarily Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. What do you think their responses uh, will be as the Taliban uh, you know, are unable to, let's say, th- there's already talk of the Tajik militants going into Tajikistan uh, to fight the Tajik government. So what do you think their responses Well, will no, be? I... I the Tajiks are in a particular position because of the the very large Tajik population, more than 20 percent in Afghanistan. And of course, the Tajik opposition right now is being led by the son of Ahmed Shah Massoud. Um, and and uh, a lot of the Afghan Tajiks have, after the defeat in the Panjshir Valley in the last few weeks, a lot of them have taken shelter. As far as we know, the vice president... Um, uh, uh, Saleh. Saleh, Amrullah Saleh is in Tajikistan. I can only presume that so is the um, son of Ahmed Shah Massoud um, also there. But uh, it's, it's, uh, we don't know in, in a confirmed way. But uh, clearly the Tajiks are going to give shelter to um, any Tajik, Afghan Tajik opposition that emerges. Um, the other countries are, are playing a, a less of a role. They're, they're very scared of refugees flooding into their country. They've shut their borders. Um, the Uzbeks in particular, uh, they don't want Afghan um, Uzbeks flooding into their borders or Afghans of any kind. And um, their role in this airlift has been very minimal. Mm-hmm. And especially when you hear about countries like Albania yeah. and uh, yeah. Italy um, mm-hmm. being very gracious hosts to Afghan refugees, but that is not the case with these neighbors, who, after all, they, they share ethnicity. They share ethnic brotherhood with many of the ethnic groups in Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, so far, at least, they haven't responded to helping uh, the Afghan refugees or even taking in uh, Afghan refugees. Um, and certainly they're worried. I mean, I remember very well the panic in, in Tashkent when uh, the Taliban... Uh, uh, took Kabul and started moving northwards to take mazar sharif And I was in Tashkent at the time, and there was absolute panic in the government. They had no idea who these people were, the Taliban. And um, now I think that they're, they're much feeling much more secure. Mm-hmm. Russia is a backup for all of them. Uh, the Russian military is very much involved in securing the border with Afghanistan. Um, so I think they're in a much stronger position, but uh, they're not necessarily going to help in in the peace process or even in the refugee process that we're, we're going to see. And, um, uh, you know, I think that's that's uh, uh, that's sad. I, I, other people have been doing their bit for the Afghan refugees and the Central Asians are really uh, not accepting to do it. Well, you brought up Amrullah Saleh and Ahmad Massoud. Is there any hope for an effective resistance from the from the Panchiris or Tajiks, 
especially in the absence of any tangible external support? Well, I think uh, the the um, the resistance that erupted immediately after the Taliban takeover of Kabul has now been defeated, basically, and driven out of Panjshir. Um, and um, and probably in exile in Tajikistan or or in areas further north. Um, so uh, you know, for the time being, I don't think we're going to see an armed resistance. But I I still believe that um, I, there's going to be a lot more people's resistance. Of in in I mean, the other day there was a massive demonstration in Kandahar, the heartland of uh, uh, the Taliban and the origins of the whole Taliban movement, they, people were protesting that the Taliban leaders had come in and, and, and confiscated flats and houses that, yeah. Uh, yeah. that they occupied. So, you know, any misstep yeah. by the Taliban, and it's quite mm -hmm. likely that they will um, mm -hmm. be creating problems for themselves, uh, any misstep by the Taliban is going to be met by public anger and resistance. Mm -hmm. And... Um, um, I think, you know, one ex extremely negative aspect of the Taliban so far has been that every time Western nations or neighboring states have said something positive, such mm -hmm. as, you know, we will provide humanitarian aid or we're trying to get keep people, NGOs active and trying to bring the UN back and, or anything remotely positive has been um, immediately countermanded by the Taliban with the a very negative statement, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and some measure they take which immediately annoys everyone. So, for example, I mean, when um, you know the the women are now barred from the Kabul University, um, just when there's talk about humanitarian aid coming mm -hmm. into Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so they they really seem to be um, knocking themselves out with every every measure they take. And this, of course, can be a deliberate policy of, mm -hmm. of basically snubbing the West and saying, mm -hmm. we're not interested in your help or your aid. Now, it hasn't come to that yet, but it may well do. Well, we also know that there's a kind of looming, the UN calls it a looming humanitarian catastrophe. So there is this dilemma, isn't it, that you, you know, the international community wants to send urgent humanitarian aid to Afghanistan but they're also aware of, you know, the the trade-off, which is that the money falls into the Afghan, uh, the hands of the Taliban, and it kind of empowers and legitimizes the Taliban. So, what do you think would be a way to address sort of a middle, find a middle ground between these two um, um, problems, the dilemma? Well, I, I, I think you know the, the lead role should be played by the UN, mm -hmm. and uh, and. Uh, even even at the political level, I think the lead role should be played by the UN now. I think the, the, the Americans need to step back uh, a, a little bit um, mm -hmm. and not try and, um, and even the neighboring countries would welcome a much stronger UN presence. Now, uh, if you look back at Doha, the fact was that the UN was totally ignored by the Americans in Doha. Um, it had no hardly any role to play whatsoever, even though... Um, uh, the UN is still respected and and uh, unliked by many Afghans. And of course, it's got both a political arm and a humanitarian arm. And the UN is in a much stronger position to do a synchronization of these two arms and be able to bring the two together, humanitarian and political, um, and, and convince the Taliban to, to, to compromise, convince the Western international community to compromise and come up with something that at least would feed basically feed the Afghan people. It has been, I think, very self-destructive of the Americans not to have included the UN much earlier on at a much more um, high level of, especially in the negotiations in Doha. Um, and and, uh, and we, we, we just haven't uh, seen that, unfortunately. They, had, they appointed an ambassador, Jean Arnaud, a very, a very uh, reputable uh, UN mediator, um, who was then ignored uh, by the Americans and ignored by everyone. Um, and there was no uh, passage of his authority in the Security Council or debate about what he should be doing. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, it's unfortunate, but the Secretary General also 
um, has, has really not played uh, the role that was expected of him in, uh, in, 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 in this whole crisis. We haven't heard much from the Secretary General of the UN um, <laughs> for the last month or two. So your advice to President uh, Biden would be to do no harm? Uh, I mean, this, as you as you point out, American unilateralism is, you know, uh, has been kind of the the prominent uh, feature of this crisis in Afghanistan. Um, so, what would you say to President Biden if he asked you for a, for your advice on how to deal with the Taliban regime? I'm hardly one to give uh, Biden any advice, but certainly the faults that we have seen mm -hmm. in the last four or five weeks have been pretty mm -hmm. catastrophic. Mm -hmm. for the whole Western effort. Um, the faults of the big powers, the fact that there was no initial uh, uh, consulting, consulting with NATO, mm -hmm. the, NATO the Europeans were completely upset uh, with the Americans, the fact that uh, there was the withdrawal of the American troops before mm -hmm. the civilians were withdrawn, mm -hmm. which was, I, in military terms, it's the most shameful thing you can do. Um, you know, and the whole American saga of never leave anyone behind, etc., was was a joke. I mean, you know, the all, the entire embassy was left behind while the pullout of the three thousand troops was taking place, and it was so chaotic that then Biden had to send in six thousand troops in order to allow uh, to take to allow the withdrawal to take place. So, I mean, there, there, there have been, you know, um, all these faults. But I, we have to go back to Doha because, you know, mm -hmm. Doha was a very flawed agreement. Mm -hmm. It was an agreement that did not include um, the uh, uh, Afghan government. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And it, it completely demoralized and disillusioned the Afghan the cabinet, the ministers, the politicians in the country. Um, how would the Afghans salvage anything from the Doha agreement mm -hmm. when the Americans were, were refusing to include them in any consultation? Mm -hmm. so I think that was a huge mistake. And um, uh, I think, secondly, I think there, there, wa there has been, there was a moderate Taliban that did want a settlement, that wanted a peaceful settlement. Um, and... Uh, we, we don't know exactly how they were treated by the Americans and how they were treated by their fellow Taliban, but they, they should have been strengthened. Their mm -hmm. whole position should have been strengthened rather than uh, ignored. Um, I think the UN should be still playing a major role, especially in um, uh, food and distribution and uh, civil society. Um, and again, we see a little sign of the Americans uh, uh, ac accepting that. Um, and the Americans should provide the aircraft or, or whatever is needed for an airlift of, uh, of supplies, you know, to, to the Afghans. I mean, the last thing that could, uh, which would, could really destroy, undermine everything has, would be famine in Afghanistan um, and, uh, and people dying of hunger and pictures like we saw in Ethiopia and Sudan and other places happening in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, that really would be a disastrous, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanted to uh, pursue the moderate Taliban uh, um, narrative, but um, I think it's time to take questions from the audience. We have a question here that says, um, Afghanistan is not the same place um, that, as the last time the Taliban took control. Um, how will the Taliban govern in the context of social change, especially in regard to women's rights? You know, the, the, there are a number of facts that have to be acknowledged. The first is that the whole issue of women's rights is an urban phenomenon. Mm -hmm. it, it is not, I mean, certainly girls are going to school in the rural areas as well. And there's been a huge influx of girls going to school. But at the same time, the... The, the battle for women's rights is being fought in the cities. It's not necessarily being fought um, in, in, in the countryside. Secondly, there's been, you know, to see every Taliban now with a, with a cell phone, with an iPhone, mm -hmm. is quite mm -hmm. remarkable for me especially because I had a, such a, I, it was impossible to even photograph the Taliban mm -hmm. when back in, in 93, 94. And, um, you know, I was shocked because the Mujahideen love being photographed. And, you know, they, they, um, they all wanted to be photographed with their guns and mm -hmm. macho sort of uh, positions. And um, 
And I, I, then I came across the Taliban who refused to have any pictures taken. And now we are seeing the Taliban shooting their own pictures. And they realized, I think, that, you know, obviously media and is, is, a, is a great step forward. Um, they are trying to curb the media, the, the TV especially, but they also are trying to keep it running because they know the importance. Last time they had ignored the, um, uh, the, the television and they had, in fact, uh, beaten, they, they'd taken televisions out of people's houses and strung them up on lampposts. Mm. Um, uh, uh, just to show how how much they hated TV. So it, uh, things are you're absolutely right. Things are very different now. But how much change has there been in the Taliban attitude? I mean, shouldn't they have worked out a policy to towards women education before coming into power? Shouldn't they have worked out a, a policy to uh, towards crowd, crowd control? and controlling riots and, and, and demonstrations in a more peaceful manner than what they do at present. Should they still be going around beating people and whipping uh, women and men, um, you know, uh, uh, like they did last time? And it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible to see that the Taliban have really not focused at all on these, uh, you know, as a political movement, they have not focused at all on the politics of maintaining law and order, providing governance, et cetera. And so I fear that the Taliban are only going to look after themselves. That means that, you know, anything that arrives from donors, from the West, concessions, it will be about the Taliban and feeding them and looking, making sure that their soldiers are looked after and fed rather than uh, real attempts at governance and policy making. I don't think we're going to see that for... Um, quite some time. We're not going to see new policies emerge, and we're not going to see good governance. Thanks, Simon. Um, we have another question, an important one, I believe. Is there any hope or venue for negotiations for a future, more permanent political system with the Taliban in power? You know, the 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 Taliban can't, don't believe in sharing power. I mean, this was very clear in, in 96 when they took Kabul. It's very clear when they took Kabul again a, a month ago. Um, they've been forced to, to take on a few of the non-Pashtuns, non-Taliban people, but it's a handful with people with very little authority and very little power. So um, I'm a, a very pessimistic. I don't see the Taliban really ad adopting towards a more pl plural, uh, semi-democratic system, um, allow, you know, bringing in people from the outside, bringing in technical people. Um, and, you know, so countries that will want to invest in Afghanistan, like the Chinese, are going to find life very difficult, I think. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not going to be easy to help um, uh, uh, the Taliban. They're going to be very reluctant to accept help. And that was the case before. It's the case now. As I said, I mean, every positive step by the international community is met by some negative measure that they take. And, uh, and that completely degrades the whole uh, gesture of friendship that they, people are trying to give them. Um, the, the next question from the audience is, uh, what was Pakistan's specific role in getting the Haqqanis into the Afghan government? And if I might add, you recall that the chief of the director general of the ISI, General Fass, uh, there's this famous photo of him enjoying a cup of tea and telling a, a British journalist, don't worry, everything will be fine. Yeah, well, you know, um, I don't know to what extent the, the, the Pakistanis um, influenced the, the Haqqanis coming in. But the, I think there are several indicators. There's been no regret uh, that Mullah Brother is no longer in the same powerful position that he was during Doha. Uh, and he was considered to be, he is considered to be one of the more moderate elements of, of the Taliban and who believes in negotiations. Um, I think, you know, a broader leadership would have been um, you know, you. I think the Taliban would probably have entered into talks with the, with the with the West about um, food supplies and about all these kinds of things. Um, 
but it's 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 difficult if you're a Western diplomat or an American diplomat to talk to the Haqqanis. And um, the Haqqanis want legitimacy and they want to be re reinstalled as leading actors in Afghanistan's politics. And the, the fact of the matter is that the Taliban don't seem to realize that that, 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 that can't happen. And uh, uh, the Haqqanis are not a viable partner for um, uh, Americans, Pakistan, or anyone else, uh, to, um, to they can be they can be bought into a, a settlement for the time being, but the, they can't be the the lead actor, and they want to be the lead actors, and uh, that's why we've seen that they're occupying these key positions in the cabinet, um, and uh, uh, they they are determined to to get the Americans to lift the fl no fly no-fly zone and a no-fly um, uh, rule against them. They want to be able to travel, uh, go, go to Saudi Arabia and back. Um, and now, it's uh, very unlikely that, you know, the Taliban may give them permission to do that, but it's very unlikely that Western countries will. I mean, I, it's, uh, I'm quite stunned because, again, the Taliban have just dropped another stone on their foot. Uh, I mean, maybe the Haqqanis pushed their way into these very prominent positions in the cabinet, but um, it, it, it's going to turn out to be a, a very disastrous um, uh, case for the Taliban uh, to have these as your front and side uh, representatives uh, trying to negotiate with Western countries. Uh, just to follow up, shouldn't uh, Pakistan be more pleased with the Haqqanis in the in the cabinet, or is it uh, the Haqqanis are not really under you know any kind of uh, obligation to listen to what Pakistan wants? I think there's certainly there's that element that uh, I don't think any Afghan is going to be listening that much to Pakistan now yeah. than they did yeah. before. Um, uh, uh, the next step, which you you might see, which will probably shock everyone in Pakistan, will be the Haqqanis meeting with the Indian ambassador um, after having attacked the Indian embassy in Kabul several times. Um, and uh, um, so, uh, but I, I, as I said, I think Pakistan's influence is going to be limited. And uh, anyone seem to be trying to insert the Haqqanis into the uh, in, into the mainstream negotiations with the West, with the UN, with with the neighboring countries, with the Chinese, uh, are going to be faced with um, a real uh, criticism from their fellow countries, I think. Uh, you mentioned India. I mean, it has been a, a, a kind of a shock, right, for India. India invested something to the tune of three to four billion dollars in uh, reconstruction and aid in Afghanistan. And now that all, all of that is gone. Um, and so what do you see India's option or response should be to, to what's happening uh, under the Taliban? Yeah, I, I, I think what has happened is, is India is a very clear loser in, in mm -hmm. what has happened. Um, but India is still saying that they will continue aid to Afghanistan. Uh, they will strike. Uh, it, it's going to be very difficult for them to deal with the Taliban. Um, they will be waiting for another, perhaps a more moderate version of the Taliban in government, a different kind of uh, government. Um, but at the moment, clearly they've lost out. And there's been a lot of hand-wringing in Delhi as mm -hmm. to um, mm -hmm. how narrow-minded the Indian policy has been over the years mm -hmm. uh, by refusing to recognize uh, the Taliban and linking everything to linking the Taliban to Kashmir and linking Pakistan's role to um, uh, Kashmir, um, which which really has, has not, it, it's a very important part of the puzzle for Pakistan, but it's not part of the puzzle for the Afghans. And uh, to for the Indians to think that, you know, the Afghans are totally preoccupied with liberating Kashmir or turning it over to, to Pakistan, it's, it's a, it's, it's just not true. It's far. It's wishful thinking. It's far from the truth. Um, uh, Afghans, you know, I, I've been meeting Afghans from all sides, and you know, they, they have enough problems of their own without getting involved in Kashmir. And uh, so, and unfortunately, I. But the fact that Pakistan makes that the Indians are sabotaging 
Pakistan through Afghanistan, and that they are uh, even the TTP, the, the Pakistani Taliban, are being funded by India. Um, I don't think the TTP need to be funded by India. Mm -hmm. uh, they're heavily involved in the drug trade. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with all the illegal um, e economic smuggling that is taking place from Afghanistan. Um, they, they are not short of money, weapons, or any, anything else. So, um, yes, I mean, there might be very possible that the Indians are also um, uh, funding them, but it's more likely that elements in Afghanistan are funding them. Um, in particular, the Taliban, the, the Afghan Taliban, and, and other uh, splinter groups that have emerged. So, I mean, I think we, we, we have to adopt greater realism. Um, India is a part of the region. It's, uh, it is not a neighbor of Afghanistan, but it will have to be accommodated in some way because I India, again, is too powerful a neighbor to leave out. Um, and, and the Western countries and the international community is certainly going to involve India in the deliberations on Afghanistan. So you can't, you can't do away with that for all of a sudden. Well, I think we're almost close um, to 11 o'clock. Um, just a question if, you know, Ahmed, you've probably been asked this before, this has crossed your mind. Should we be looking forward to a 2021 edition of the Taliban book? And if so, what would you say? Well, uh, actually, uh, two of my books, Descent into Chaos and Taliban, are being reissued okay. by my pub okay. publishers with, with a new forward. Okay. And uh, both of them will have new forwards. So uh, that's very encouraging. There's, apparently, they're sold out everywhere. People are trying to get their hands on Taliban. Uh, the Taliban book is still very relevant because, you know, the, the why and wherefore of the Taliban is, is, mm -hmm. is very much the same as it was, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, the geopolitics has changed and uh, the, the politics of some of the warlords and uh, has changed, but not the Taliban. They are very consistent. Okay, Ahmed. I really want to acknowledge again. Thank you so much for uh, giving us uh, your time and your your thoughts and your analysis. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye.